You think the werewolf of Werewolf Springs was crazy? Wait till you see what lives down the road. Hey, I'm Neoma Finn. Way back when I first presented the story of Werewolf Springs on Cameron Buckner's What If It's True channel, I paired it with another story about another cryptid just down the road from Burns. In fact, if you follow that road the farmer and his hired hand were on when they were attacked, it'll take you right to it. The town is White Bluff, Tennessee, and they call the creature the White Bluff Screamer. There are several origin stories about the Screamer, depending on what people believe it is. The one I remember has nothing to do with any sort of cryptid, but it's such a sad story in so many ways that it's the one that stuck in my mind. As such, it's the one I'm going to share with you now. Many years ago, there was an older couple who lived in a little hollow, or as they say down here, a holler, outside of White Bluff. They were a happy couple who built their house with the hope of filling it with a large family. But try as they might, they were never blessed with children. Time passed and they began to age, and that dream of a house full of children slowly began to fade. Then, just as the woman decided she was getting too old to conceive, she discovered she was pregnant. Imagine the joy those two felt at the knowledge that they were finally going to welcome a new member to their little family. The man built a cradle and boasted around town that he was going to be a papa, and the woman set about making baby clothes and preparing the nursery. No people could have felt greater joy than those two. Folks around town were happy for them. Men were always patting the soon-to-be father on the back, while the ladies were cooing and awing over the expectant mama. When the time came, the doctor was called to the house, and the father paced around on the front porch, while the mother labored to bring their little bundle of joy into the world. But all was not well. It was a difficult labor. It always is when the first baby comes so late in life. There were complications. The doctor worried that the poor woman wouldn't make it. Even if he pulled her through, he was convinced the baby didn't have a prayer. Nighttime faded into dawn, and then daylight slid behind the horizon, and still no baby. Finally, two full days after the doctor first arrived, with one last Herculean push, the woman expelled the baby and collapsed into a deep, exhausted sleep. The fatigued doctor wrapped the newborn in a blanket, walked out onto the porch, and said, Congratulations! It's a girl! Tears poured down the man's cheeks as he held his little daughter in his arms and looked into her tiny face for the first time. Then he remembered his wife and looked frantically at the doctor. She's okay, he assured him. She's sleeping now. Let her rest. Despite the trauma the woman had gone through in delivering her child, she soon recovered. Neighboring wives were there to help out where needed, but before long, life settled into a normal routine for the man and his wife. They knew this would be their only child. Even if the woman could conceive another, there was no way the man was willing to watch his wife go through that again. But they were happy. It wasn't until later that they began to notice that something was horribly wrong with their little girl. She wasn't a pretty child, but she didn't come from pretty stock. Sure, she had a little more peach fuzz on her body than the average baby, but the doctor assured her parents that babies with dark hair often did, that the peach fuzz didn't go away, and in fact seemed to be coming in thicker, was a reason for some concern, but not the most horrible thing, the older couple thought. When it was time for the little girl to take her first steps, they were a bit disappointed that it took so long. But it had taken them a long time to conceive her, so maybe it was only fitting that it would take a long time for her to walk. The crooked, twisted, spidery walk that she finally accomplished was more than a little disconcerting, but she would straighten out eventually. And that voice. Who would have thought the word mama could ever sound so harsh and demonic coming from such a small child? When she was two, and they caught her strangling the baby chickens in the chicken coop, there were no more excuses to be had. The old couple had to accept that they had not received a gift from heaven. They'd been sent a curse from hell. In their shame and disappointment, and perhaps out of their fear for her violent nature, they moved their daughter to the fruit cellar under the floor. They began to make fewer and fewer visits to town, and when they did, they didn't speak often about their little girl. 
Over time, people quit asking. It was assumed that the child must have caught fever and died. It wasn't uncommon back then. It was a time when a quarter of all children born didn't survive their first year, and nearly half didn't live to see adulthood. Poor farmers tended to litter their properties with the graves of those children. It didn't make their sorrow any less. It was the simple, harsh reality of life in a time before hospitals and advanced medical care. For the next 15 years, the little girl grew up in the cellar. Every day, her parents opened the trap door in the floor and tossed down some food and water. But other than that, they pretended the child didn't exist. Somehow, she survived. She grew stronger and meaner and angry. The day finally came when she climbed the rickety stairs and burst through the door, attacked her parents, and killed them. Free now, she escaped into the woods around the little farm, and they say, to this day, you can hear her terrible screams at night. All by itself, that's one creepy story, but there's more. Sometime around 1920, a man and his wife, looking for a place to live, found the farmhouse and moved into it with their seven children. At last, it would be filled with the joy and laughter of the large family it was meant for. The father of the house was an experienced farmer, so he and his oldest son spent most of their days clearing the fallow fields and preparing them to once again produce a harvest. The mother, with the help of the older daughters, worked hard to restore the interior of the house to a livable condition. They knocked down cobwebs, cleaned windows, swept floors, and planted a small house garden to keep them fed throughout the coming winter. The younger children spent their days tending to farm animals. It wasn't long before the family had comfortably settled into their new home. The father and his sons often took their rifles and went into the woods to hunt deer, rabbits, squirrels, and a wide variety of other animals that weren't necessarily good eating, but whose hides sold for a reasonable profit. For all the world, it seemed that they had found their paradise. It wasn't to last. One night, a few months after the family had moved in, they were all awakened by a horrible scream coming from somewhere in the woods near the house. The mother and father jumped from their beds to look out the windows. The older children did the same. The younger ones buried their heads under the covers and whimpered in fear. There didn't appear to be anything out there, but the sounds of the screaming seemed to come from all directions as whatever was making them apparently walked around and around the house. The father took his rifle and a lantern and went out onto the porch. Holding the light as high as he could, he squinted into the black forest that surrounded the house. A heavy mist clutched at the bases of the trees, but nothing stirred in it. He noticed a distinct lack of sound at that moment. No crickets, no owls. No night creature scurrying around in the dark. Nothing. Then that awful scream broke the silence and he swung hard to his right, searching for the source. In horror, he watched as a patch of mist picked itself up and swirled into a vaguely human shape, then floated into the night. Pate's sake, he scolded himself with a nervous laugh. You're jumping at the wind now. Then he turned and stepped back through the front door, telling himself it was a natural thing to do. Nothing out there. Why not go back inside, where it's warm and safe? After that, the screams came on a fairly regular basis. First, it was a week or so later. Then another week after that. Then it was maybe five days. Then four. By the end of the month, something was outside their house, screaming every night. The children felt it worst. Each evening, they watched the sky turn black with apprehension, their anxiety increasing with each new sunset. They climbed into each other's beds, afraid now to sleep alone. Even when the screams didn't come, the nightmares did. Cries of terrors from inside the house often had them all wide awake and alarmed, as first one child and then another sat up in bed, horrified by the cruelty of their own imaginations. The parents were equally on edge. Night after night of comforting children and listening to some unknown beast terrorize them from the woods left them short-tempered and frustrated. Arguments arose within the household over things that would have meant nothing before, but now seemed monumental. The parents were equally on edge. 
night after night of comforting children and listening to some unknown beast terrorize them from the woods left them short-tempered and frustrated. Arguments arose within the household over things that would have meant nothing before, but now seemed monumental. Their prayers were for release from this strange captivity. Somewhere in the backs of everyone's minds, they all knew. Either the beast was going to get them, or they were going to turn on each other. Finally, after a solid month of unrelenting wails from deep in the woods, the father sat up in bed, jerked on his clothes, and declared, This is gonna end. By God, it's gonna stop tonight, or I'm gonna die trying. Against his wife's pleading cries for reason, he grabbed his gun and lantern and headed off into the woods to hunt down and kill the ungodly creature that was tearing his family apart. He tramped over the hills and down into the valleys, wandered along the creek beds and through briars that scratched at him. Periodically, he stopped and listened for the unholy scream. When it came, and it always did, he turned in that direction and marched onward. A few times, he caught sight of a white mist floating through the trees. He gave chase, but it was always gone before he reached it. After hours of chasing phantoms through the dense woods, the man sat down on a fallen log and watched as the first tentative rays of sunlight paled the sky to a deep grayish blue. He was exhausted beyond measure. Climbing hills and fighting brambles combined with his disappointment at coming up empty to leave him crestfallen and devastated. With a deep sigh, he decided it was time to go home. He barely had time to get to his feet when he heard screams again. They were different this time. It wasn't the scream of one beast, it was the screams of many. It was the agonized cries of terror and pain of someone, several someones, being attacked. And they were coming from the direction of his house. Pushing aside his own lassitude, he broke into a dead run. He scrambled through briars that tore at his clothes and left deep scratches and welts on his face, jumped murky streams and sank ankle-deep into their muddy banks, pulled himself up and over rocky outcroppings, and tumbled down steep hills until at last he came into his own little holler. The front door was open as he approached. His heart threatened to burst from his chest as his feet hit the first step of the porch. The sickening smell of death bellowed from the interior of the house, warning him before he ever entered what he was going to find. At the threshold, he pulled up short. He put his hand up on the door to brace himself against the wave of nausea and horror that greeted him, but he pulled it away quickly when he felt the warm, sticky blood he'd placed it in. The entire inside of the house looked as though a bomb had gone off. Blood, internal organs, and body parts littered the floor and were splattered across the walls. He screamed for his wife, but there was no answer. At his feet, he saw what he knew was all that was left of his oldest son. Tears welled up then, and this time it was he who unleashed the unholy scream. The sheriff came out and made his report. The entire family had been decimated by some unknown being. Panther, maybe, the sheriff said. Neighbors came along and guided the broken man away from the devastation. For a few days, he stayed with some friends in town. Then one morning, he awoke and announced that he was going back into the woods to find whatever had killed his family, and he wasn't coming back till it was dead. That was the last anyone ever saw the farmer. Over the years, there have been many sightings of some strange animal in the woods around White Bluff, Tennessee. They nearly always describe it as being white. Some say it's a white Bigfoot. Others claim it's a white dogman. It's easy to assume it's the same werewolf that lives around Werewolf Springs, except that it's nearly always white. It might not be a Bigfoot or a dogman at all. It could be that little girl whose parents locked her in the cellar, or her ghost. Or it could be nothing more than a white mist and tricks played by the wind. As for the farmer, no one knows for sure whatever happened to him. Maybe that thing got him too. Maybe he's still out there looking for the white bluff screamer. I'm Neoma Finn.